Hey guys, my name is Eric and I work for AeroGuard Flight Training Center. Uh, today we're going to learn a little bit about how the airspeed indicator works and uh, sort of the nuances involved. Uh, so to kind of get us started, what I want to do is, is take a look inside of the instrument and see if uh, we can understand how uh, the airspeed indicator displays our appropriate airspeed. So, uh, behind the face of the instrument, what we see here is, uh, first we have this diaphragm inside, and what we notice is that this pitot pressure uh, is what's going inside of this diaphragm, and then the static pressure goes into the case around that diaphragm. So what's the significance of this? Well, as you may recall from one of our previous videos, the pitot pressure is a combination of the static air plus our speed, or sometimes they call that dynamic pressure. So what we're trying to do then is we don't want a factor of, of change in altitude, which would actually change the pressure of the, the pitot air, uh, to affect what's indicated on the airspeed indicator. So in essence, all we're doing is we're just comparing the pitot pressure to the static pressure. So another way to say that is we're comparing the static and the velocity pressure to just the static pressure. So in essence, what happens then is these basically negate or cancel each other out, and that way what's, what's indicated on the airspeed indicator by the expansion and contraction of this diaphragm is simply a result of the velocity change and not a result of any static pressure changes. All right, so let's go on ahead and look at how we read the airspeed indicator. So on a standard single engine airplane, we usually see a configuration kind of like this, where we'll see what we call a white arc on the, air, on the airspeed indicator. We'll have a green arc on the airspeed indicator. We have a yellow arc on the airspeed indicator, and we usually will find a red radial line. Uh, and these, these different uh, colors indicate different ranges, right? So this white arc indicates our flaps operating range. This green arc identifies the normal operating range. This yellow arc represents a sort of a caution or smooth air only range. Uh, and then the red line indicates uh, our maximum speed that we can go in this aircraft. So these lines or these colors have a starting point and an ending point and these starting points and ending points are uh, indicated by um, a, a, a particular V speed as we call it and so they're, they're usually speeds that uh, we often have committed to memory but we can also read them from the airspeed indicator. So let's go over a few that we do find on the airspeed indicator. So the first one is the beginning of the white arc, is known as VSO, which is our stall speed in the landing configuration. Uh, the end of the white arc down here is VFE, which is our maximum flaps extended speed. The green arc starts from VS, or sometimes it's VS1, and that's our stall speed in the clean configuration, typically, in most aircraft, and then the top of the green arc is VNO, which is our maximum structural cruising speed. Maximum structural cruising speed indicates uh, that we could, we could go outside of our, uh, our, our load factor tolerances relatively easily. So one of the big uh, elements to VNO is, is if we're going to fly into this yellow arc, we need to be in smooth air only, and we predominantly are going to just be flying straight and level, not a lot of aggressive maneuvers. Uh, last speed is the end of this yellow arc. There's a red radial line, VNE, and VNE is our never exceed speed, which means uh, we are never able to uh, go faster than this speed. If we do, we run the risk of uh, structural damage occurring to the aircraft, and obviously, uh, we don't want the airplane to have any problems while we're flying, so it's a good warning for us to know never to exceed that speed. 
Next, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the different types of air speeds. Uh, the first one, relatively simple, what we had just finished talking about. When we read our airspeed on the airspeed indicator, right, that is known as our indicated airspeed. Uh, just like what we had talked about before, as we look at the face of the airspeed indicator, whatever airspeed is indicated, that's, that's what we get. Uh, moving from that, we have what is known as calibrated airspeed. Now with calibrated airspeed, uh, we are applying a correction value to the indicated airspeed based on installation or, or instrument errors. Uh, where that most, uh, um, the most common example of, of where we would see something like that is um, if you imagine as we're flying along in normal straight and level flight, that pitot source is pointed almost exactly into the relative wind and therefore we have the most accurate amount of uh, ram air pressure. If, however, we slow the airplane down, uh, what happens if we maintain altitude and slow down is we end up flying at a relatively higher pitch attitude. And with that relatively higher pitch attitude, that means that our, our pitot source is not directly in line with the relative wind. So there is a little bit of a, 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 a miss on the exact ram air pressure that it's sensing. Easy way for us to prove that, right, is in most smaller aircraft, if I look at the correction table that we can find in the POH, what I usually identify is that the greatest calibration error for most smaller aircraft is generally at slower speeds. And at the normal cruising speeds, there's very little calibration error that exists. So that's just a simple example of, of what it means by this calibration error. Uh, next, I want to talk about what's known as true airspeed. And to do that, I have put a, a diagram here. This represents sort of like the ground or the earth or whatever. Uh, and I have a, a pitot mast from like a Piper aircraft, like what we fly here at AeroGuard, uh, flying at a relatively lower altitude. And then I have another one flying at a relatively higher altitude. And what you see here are these little dots. And those little dots are representing air molecules. And why I have them displayed like this is, is because of the change in air density, right? So at this lower altitude, the air molecules are more dense, which means they're closer together, right? And for all intents and purposes, what we're trying to determine is, is velocity pressure, right, of this air, and that's how we get our speed. So if, for example, I have 10 air molecules here, and let's say if all 10 of those air molecules uh, are able to, to go into the pitot tube at, in one second, that's equivalent to, uh, let's say, 100 knots indicated air speed. Okay, well, uh, imagine then uh, that we climb to a higher altitude, or now we're this airplane that's at a relatively higher altitude. What happens as we climb an altitude? The answer is the air molecules will begin to be less dense, right? So where they become less dense, if they become less dense, it means that they're more spread apart. So now these 10 air molecules are more spread apart, which means they take up more volume. So now, technically, this airplane would need to fly a greater distance in the same amount of time in order for us to also have 100 knots indicated airspeed, right? So what that means then is this, we've actually traversed a greater distance at this higher altitude than we have at this relatively lower altitude. So if we assume that this was basically at sea level or was the standard, then we would say that this was equivocal to 100 knots true airspeed, right? This covering this distance or this volume of air in that amount of time. And then that would mean then that if we, we went through this volume of air in the same amount of time, we would be at a relatively faster speed. So maybe this is something like, I don't know, 150 knots true air speed. The point I'm trying to make here is this. 
Our true airspeed is dependent upon the density of the air. So for all intents and purposes, the true airspeed is our calibrated airspeed that's been adjusted for this change in air density, whether that's pressure or temperature. Finally, we have what is known as ground speed. So the ground speed is simply the true air speed uh, corrected for the wind, right? So uh, in this example, <clears throat> if I had a true air speed, like in this case, of 150 knots, that's fine. And if, if there was no wind, then that distance through the air is equivalent to the distance over the ground. If, however, this air mass, this volume of air was moving, let's say, that direction or like, like facing us, so a headwind, uh, and let's say that wind was 10 knots, we know then that we're moving at 150 knots through the air, but relative to the ground, it would be the difference between the two. So we would then see our ground speed to be 140 knots in this example. Vice versa, if the winds came from behind us, we call that a tailwind, uh, then we would add the wind to our uh, true airspeed. So I hope that helps illuminate a little bit of uh, the different types of airspeeds and uh, how we can go about uh, calculating them as well. As always, guys, uh, I appreciate you watching our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll definitely see you on the next one. Cheers.